Hi, I'm John Rollison, and welcome to Daniel Coyle's The Culture Code in 30 minutes or less. I've been in the leadership and adult education space for over 25 years now, and one of the things I've seen is that there's a problem, and it's a book problem. And the book problem has two pieces. One is lots of leaders don't read, which means they're not leading to their full potential, and there's organizations suffer. And the other is that leaders who do read often have a difficult time getting the contents of that lead, that reading into the lives of the people in their team, group, or organization. Uh, they give them the book and the book gathers dust or they give it a cursory glance or something like that. And so my heart's desire is to step into that space and make the contents of books available for everybody in a way that is accessible to people who don't read because there's a lot of people who don't read and they're missing out. So this is one of many book summaries I do, but my real heart is in live training because there's nothing that quite matches the engagement and application of a live training session. But these are good, um, these are good halfway points, right? Between reading the book and having a live training session. I also need to tell you that I'm not an actor. I'm a live trainer. So if something might occasionally uh, go a little off and that's fine, we're going to have our 30 minutes together and that's the way things go. And I'm not going to re-record this 30,000 times to get a polished performance. So welcome to John Rallison and my life. One more thing before we uh, continue here is that um, if you're wondering how much this costs, well, it's not exactly, I don't think of it as a free video, but it's also not a video I'm charging up front for. So it's kind of like, well, you know, how valuable is it to you? And you can decide that. And we'll talk about at the end, different ways you can return value to me if I have given value to you. So let's get going. Oh, two things before we get going. First, I wanna take my ugly mug off the screen. And second, I wanna put a timer up on the screen to keep myself honest. So there we go. One timer, 30 minutes, go, go. <laughs> I told you it's a live training, sort of. Uh, I'm not an actor. Here we go. So why would you wanna to listen to Daniel Coyle? Well, I think Daniel Coyle has made some really good observations about leading organizations. And he's done that by observing a lot of organizations that have achieved not just high performance, but long-standing high performance, like over a decade was his criteria. And so he would say, and I would say, if you're not willing to listen to what he has to say, you're probably not reaching your organization's potential. There's a good chance you're like working hard to control things that you don't actually have to work hard to control. Kind of like, you're riding a bike where you have to fight it and fight it and then all of a sudden something clicks. I think that the culture code is kind of a clicking thing like that. There's a good chance you're losing or firing employees that could be significant contributors and you know that it costs a lot in time and money. And of course there's the bottom line of uh, losing needless money on all sorts of stuff that could be taken care of by modifying your corporate culture. So I'm going to start with three illustrations that we're going to run with throughout this presentation. Uh, Daniel Coyle has a lot of illustrations and a lot of different research in the book, and it's a well-written book. So uh, if you're open to recommendations, I recommend you actually read the book. But if you're not going to, <laughs> or at least if you're not going to after you get to this through this presentation, I will tell you that I have picked three illustrations to be the primary ones I'm going to run with. The first one is Disney Animation. The second one is a thing called the Tower Experiment. And the third one is a thing called the Bad Apple Experiment. So let me run through those with you very quickly. In the 1990s, Disney animation was having a horrible time. They were producing one lackluster animated film after another, which of course damages the Disney brand because they're not producing Disney level work. And you know, they're not making money on them either. So movies that you may or may not have heard of because of how mediocre they were, things like Treasure Planet, Brother Bear, The Lost Empire, and Home on the Range. So Disney did what big corporations often do. They went to go buy what they needed to succeed. 
And in this case, in 2006, Disney bought Pixar Animation. And Pixar, of course, are the reigning kings and queens of animation. Uh, starting with Toy Story and continuing on, right? So what happened after 2006? Well, four years later, by 2010, Disney Animation produced Tangled, which grossed $591 million. And then it was Wreck-It Ralph, $471 million. And then Frozen, $1.2 billion, with a B. And then Big Hero 6, $657 million. And then Zootopia, which... I did not realize Zootopia was quite the hit that it was, evidently. $931 million uh, gross for Zootopia. But here's the kicker, and here's why I want you to pay attention to what Daniel Coyle has to say. Disney did this with basically no employee changes at Disney Animation. Animation. Excuse me, I told you. <laughs> we'll have a few of those moments. Disney Animation. Uh, John Lasseter and Ed Catmull, the two guys who were uh, the instrumental founders at Pixar, got offices, set up offices over in Disney, and they adjusted some things in the way the company functioned and the people related. And the same group that made Treasure Planet turned out tangled. The same people that made Brother Bear made Big Hero 6. And the same animation company that turned out Home on the Range made Frozen. So there's like the change in the quality and the profitability of these films. And it's not just one or two. It's a change from a string of lackluster movies to a string of blockbuster movies with no employee changes. What happened? To me, that's like really powerful. And I want to know what happened. What changed there? There's another thing called the bad apple experiment. And this is where experimenters take groups of 40 people uh, and give them a task to construct a marketing plan. And if you know anything about experimenting, you know that the experiment, at least social experimenting, the experimenters don't tell the people that are involved in the experiment what they're experimenting on. Because that would bias the, the research, right? So what they're really doing is seeing how long it takes somebody to derail a group. So one person in the group is a plant. His name is Nick. And he's got three different types of people he portrays. He's either a jerk, a slacker, or a downer. And in every group, Nick is able to slowly but surely bring that group down. And you've been there. Listen, you've been in groups and task forces where there's somebody who kind of just brings the whole place down. So you're going to want to listen. There was one group that Nick could not sabotage. There was a guy in there, the, uh, they call him Jonathan, for the sake of the book. And Jonathan wasn't in charge. He had no positional leadership, but he was able to keep that group going at an engaged pace. And he was able to counter whatever Nick tried to do to bring it down. What did Jonathan do that frustrated, frustrated Nick so badly? In fact, Nick even found himself wanting to be helpful, even though he's the plant who's supposed to be purposely not helpful. What did Jonathan do in these groups? The third one's the tower experiment. And the tower experiment goes like this. You have uh, teams of four people, and they are tasked with building the tallest structure they can using the following items. 20 pieces of uncooked spaghetti, one yard of transparent tape, one yard of string, and one standard size marshmallow. But here's the thing. The marshmallow has to be on the top of the tower. You ready for the kicker on this one? This is it. Teams of kindergartners regularly outperform teams of business school students, teams of lawyers, even teams of CEOs. How do kindergartners outperform these experienced and educated adults? Daniel Coyle says the answer is in the culture, the way they relate. And so that's what we're going to look at. But I need to, uh, before we move into there's three things, three basic learnable skills. But before we do that, 
I want to offer you a different way of thinking because you kind of have to think differently than uh, we often normally do when we're managing things to be able to get what Daniel Coyle is talking about. And I think the perfect illustration is the idea of a pencil sketch. Pencil sketching is hard for a lot of people. And the reason is pretty simple. Our eyes are naturally drawn to the highlights. But when you pencil sketch, you can't draw what your eyes are drawn to. You have to draw the dark spots. You have to purposely look at and actively put pencil on paper to draw what your eye is not drawn to. And so that's kind of like what we're going to look at with the culture code. When you're managing, leading a group, you're sort of naturally drawn to look at each person and see if they're performing. And the culture code is going to tell us that more important is what's going on between the people. It's kind of like learning to think like a gardener, only with people. Can you imagine a gardener who looked at the plants and said, well, this plant's not growing very well, and they tear it out and put another plant in, and then this plant is not growing very well, so you pluck it up and move it over there and stick a different plant in there? That's not the way gardeners think. Because gardeners know there, of course, are higher quality seeds and less quality th seeds and stuff. But way more important is the environment in which the plant is growing. And in a plant's case, there are three things that matter. The soil, the water, and the sunlight. And so if something's going wrong and the plants aren't growing like they should, the gardener doesn't just start ripping the plants out. The gardener checks the soil. Does the soil have the right balance and amount of different nutrients? Is the soil getting enough water? Is it getting too much water? Is it getting the right amount of sunshine? So the gardener adjusts those things. And that's the way we need to start thinking, according to Daniel Coyle, about our groups. We need to be able to look between the groups like the pencil sketch artist. And then we need to think about what we adjust in the environment to change the group culture and therefore the group performance rather than looking just at the people, their performance, plucking them out, moving them around, things like that. That's the basic message of the culture code. High group performance is achieved through group relationships more than individual proficiencies. And so the way these relationships function for group performance is based on three learnable skills. And they're skills that anybody could learn. And I now have 19 minutes and 15 seconds to walk you through all three skills. We'd better get moving. The first skill is to build a sense of safety and belonging. People are wired for safety. If you want your group members to achieve maximum performance or creativity, they have to feel safe. In our past, in the jungle, in, in all those kinds of environments, safety was more important than creativity. You had to keep your, while you were hunting, you had to keep your eyes out for animals that might be hunting you. When you're in a, it, it, when you're with your tribe or your group, you need to be aware. The most important thing is to be able to remain with your tribe, because if you get kicked out, the chances of someone surviving alone are very low. And so what that means is that we are wired to monitor for threats more than we are wired to bring out our best creativity and, uh, you know, our risky ideas and things. And so Daniel Coyle says that when he looked at organizations, he found that the ones that had sustained high performance worked to build a sense of safety and belonging. And the reason is because then that little safety mechanism in our brain that tells us to, to first monitor for threats can be turned off. And the uh, creative uh, expression of our thoughts can go forward. So build safety and belonging. In the, in the good apple, the bad apple experiments, what happened was that 
the good apple, Jonathan, frustrated Nick's, Nick tried to derail the group either by down, you know, talking down everything or, or just by being, you know, melancholy or, or being like a jerk. And no matter what Nick did, the plant, Jonathan did something in response to that, that basically countered it and said, well, that's not the way I think. And I don't think the group needs to think that. Here's what the researchers wrote. Basically, Jonathan makes it safe. He turns to the other people and asks, what do you think of this? Sometimes he even asks Nick questions like, how would you do this or how would you do that? But most of all, Jonathan radiates an idea into the room. That's something like, hey, this is all comfortable and enjoyable and engaging. And I'm curious about what everyone has to say. And the researcher said it was amazing to see how such simple, small behaviors kept everybody engaged and on task. And even Nick, almost against his will, found himself being helpful. And so Jonathan, whenever Nick threw in cues of uh, uh, his relationship damaging cues, Jonathan would jump in with something that said, no, 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 this is a safe environment. He would listen to people, including he would listen to Nick, but then he would respond with something positive and energy levels would open up. And when, uh, when Jonathan countered Nick's downer with his um, listening and energy, the energy levels in the room actually improved because people saw there, there was like a little thing, like which kind of room is this, right? And people saw that this was a room that was safe. And so they're actually free to, to bring those things, bring their selves more into the room. Now, this tower experiment, here's what's going on there. The business school students, the CEOs, they look like they're collaborating on the tower, but they're not, 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 that's not the first thing that's really going on in the priority of their brains. What's really going on is something that psychologists call status management. They're underlying questions are who's in charge is it okay to criticize what are the rules here the kindergartners the <laughs> their actions appear disorganized but they're not actually fighting each other right they're not they're not competing for status they're just standing there they're all working they're grabbing things and whatever the truth is the the kindergartners are working more like a functional brain where everybody's grabbing for things and there's they're not competing for status and the adults when they're together are functioning like a less healthy brain where it's competing against each other in this kind of status man status management things and so as he looked at the kind of things and of course there's always more in the book i could say that throughout this entire presentation and i probably will a few more times but there are four things that daniel coyle noticed that really seemed to be part of building a sense of safety and belonging. And we're going to give some practical suggestions here in a moment too. But here's the four things. The first of the thought principles is if we're trying to build safety and belonging, we have to think organically, which is, again, like a gardener. Like how do I create and what do I need to do in this space with these people to create an environment that's safe? We're going to get to many of those in a moment. Uh, he noticed that there's a sense of proximity that organizations use. There was an experiment done where communication significantly dropped off between coworkers who were more than 30 feet apart. Even when they were 30 feet more than 30 feet apart, the frequency of the emails dropped off a lot too, which you know you would think the opposite, kind of like intuitively because you don't need email if someone's 20 feet away. But it was a close physical proximity. Uh, as a leader, you have to observe not just the individual performance, but the patterns of interaction. And the fourth thing is not to just declare how this group is going to be. We are going to be a safe environment, right? That's not going to go anywhere. Um, it's constant cueing. You're, you're, you're learning how to sow seeds of safety and belonging. And you're constantly sowing those into the culture of your organization, of your group, of your team. So, practical suggestions, how to build safety and belonging. 
here's some things that Daniel Coyle noticed. And some of these are, are you know, something that hundreds of thousands of authors have written about before. One is you have to over communicate your listening. We always, when we think we are doing something that looks like it's listening, we know exactly what we're doing. And we think that our physical appearance looks like exactly what our brain thinks it looks like. And it's not true. You need to over communicate your listening, practice listening, lean in, eye contact, nods, responsive sounds, learn how to be a listener. And I'll make a different, whole different uh, presentation on that because you got to learn that skill. Spotlight your own fallibility early on, especially if you are a leader. If it's going to be a safe place to talk about things that you try or you might try or you did try and fail, you need to highlight your own fallibility. You have to embrace the messenger. If somebody brings bad news, you don't just not shoot the messenger. You thank them profusely for bringing that to your attention. Why? Because it's all about the organization the organization's productivity, the organization's mission, vision, and values. And when someone takes a risk to bring negative news to the forefront, they should be praised and thanks for being thanked for doing that. He noticed they overdo thank yous. Uh, they are painstaking in the hiring process, looking for people who fit. Uh, groups don't tolerate bad Apple behavior. And it's not that you're firing people all the time or anything like that. But if someone does something that like, sows seeds of lack of safety or uh, ins and in people and out people, the leaders got to pull that person aside and say, that's not what we're doing here, uh, you know, and have that kind of conversation with them. They did have a lot of the leaders created spaces, physical spaces. If you happen to all work in the same building where people bump into each other a lot, make sure everyone has a voice. That's the leader's job in every meeting, right? You got to kind of keep track of who's talking more and who's talking less, because of course some people talk more, but the leaders got to go around and say, we haven't heard from you yet. Or what do you have to, th or, you know, what do you think about what this person just said? That kind of thing. Pick up trash. That's just, uh, that everybody does everything. Evidently Ray Kroc was famous for picking up trash outside of McDonald's. And, uh, so he like, he, he wasn't the high and mighty leader. He was part of the whole organization, just like everybody is capitalize on threshold moments is where these um, there are certain moments that happen and you creatively think about how to use those to build a sense of safety and belonging at Pixar no matter who you are and what your job beforehand and even what your role at Pixar is going to be one of the things they do during the orientation is bring you into the screening room sit you in the fifth row where the director sits during screenings and say no matter who who, what you were before you got here, now you are a filmmaker. So that's uh, capitalizing on threshold moments. Don't give sandwich feedback. That's this whole thing like say something nice before you're going to give a constructive feedback and then close it with something nice. He said in the organizations he saw, that didn't happen at all. He said if people had a compliment to give, they gave it. And if they had constructive feedback to give, they gave it because everybody had aligned in the organization and they wanted the feedback. Uh, if, if somebody had a way to improve someone else's stuff, he wanted to know that. And they embraced fun. And now I have eight minutes and 50 seconds to get through the other two, which we can do because this was kind of the biggie. Because we tend to operate, you know, performance reviews and, you know, you got to do a good job to stay here and that kind of thing. And he says that's not really what's going on here. Number two, share vulnerability. Build safety and belonging and share vulnerability. If safety is the glue that holds the groups together, shared vulnerability is the muscle of how successful groups translate that connection, they're all like safety and belonging, into trusting cooperation. Share vulnerability. Amid all the fluid cooperation that he saw in things like the Navy SEALs and Pixar and stuff, were moments where clunky, hard, awkward questions could be asked and difficult conversations could be had. And in fact, in these organizations, they're by design. Pixar has a thing called a brain trust, which every movie goes through several times where the experienced directors get together and sit in a room and screen the movie and they pick it apart mercilessly, not meanly, but they don't hold anything back because everybody has the shared goal of making the best movies they can. 
Pixar SEALs engage in what they call after action reviews. After every engagement, whether it's a practice or a reel, they get together and they pick it apart moment by moment. Why did you do this? Why did you turn that direction? What were you thinking when you put your gun down, pointing that way? The whole thing. And uh, the SEALs say they're not fun, but they are vital to their performance. Even in restaurants, um, there's this sense of encouraging people to ask help instead of acting like they know what they're doing. So how do you how do you make a place where people are safe to be vulnerable? Well, you have to honor their vulnerability, right? There's a thing called the vulnerability loop, which when I say that it's perfectly natural and you will understand it, you will, because this is exactly what happens on a date. Somebody sends a signal of vulnerability. They share something slightly vulnerable. The other person detects that vulnerability. And then if you're building vulnerability, that other person responds with some sort of signal of vulnerability of their own. Like, oh, I know, like I had the same thing happen to me. This whole deal went south because I said one stupid word or whatever like that, right? And then A gets that signal of vulnerability back. And then those two people have a new norm of increased closeness and trust. And that's good for your organization. How to share vulnerability. First of all, it's the leader's job to share first and share often. And that doesn't mean vulnerability in all aspects. You're not wearing your heart on your sleeve, but share the fact that you've made mistakes. Remember that um, uh, good decisions come from experience and experience comes from bad decisions, right? So share it. Uh, over communicate your expect expectations when you're forming new groups focus keep your eyes out for that first moment of vulnerability and honor it right if someone else is vulnerable uh, um, uh, make sure you embrace that with all the soft warmth you can and then and then share back on a vulnerability thing uh, to to initiate that loop and then the first disagreement is always really important because remember we're honoring and celebrating the disagreement Listen skillfully. We talked about that before. Uh, resist the temptation to add value immediately to the conversation. You know you have great things to add, but hold back. Uh, initiate candor generating practices in your organization, like the brain trust we talked about, like AAR. Red teaming is putting together another team of people to specifically uh, nitpick and tear apart the first person's plan to make it a better plan for the whole company. You got to embrace discomfort. If you're in a project, and you're moving forward and you've never had any uncomfortable, awkward, difficult, this uncomfortable moments, you should say, oh no, something's wrong because we haven't had any awkward, uncomfortable moments. Align your language with your action. Separate performance reviews and professional development. That's really important. And I've seen that in the setting where I'm working now is obviously you have to have performance reviews, but give professional development outside the context of performance reviews. Flash mentoring is is shadowing for like a day or two and then have the leader occasionally not even be around. And that lets the other groups, the other people in the group all form up with uh, their shared vulnerability and their sense of uh, belonging without the leader there. Number three, establish purpose. And this one is the short section because so much has been written on this already. High purpose environments are filled with small, vivid signals designed to create a link between the present moment and the future ideal. So you're always pointing to the future ideals when you're trying to establish the purpose for your organization. And as I said, lots of stuff has been written about having clear mission and vision and values and really aligning yourself around those purposes. Now he points out that there's two different types. There's two basic types of tasks that go on in organizations. There are tasks that call for proficiency, like um, call centers, and there's tasks that call for creativity. And he says those two have to be managed slightly differently. For proficiency, it's naming, clarifying your values, continuing to throw those out, and even using catchphrases like goofy, stupid, silly catchphrases. But you use them over and over again, and they begin to they begin to be part of that environment, and the culture. And you got to keep sending them. It's every day. It's not once. 
that once is like the the husband who told his wife listen i told you i love you if it changes i'll tell you instead of telling his wife he loves her every day right so uh the other type of task is creativity and that's really where you got to encourage that willingness to fail encourage willingness to hear crazy ideas uh, face forward toward the problems embrace the people who point out what's wrong not not the people who say this won't work but point out problems that might keep it from working uh, just keep it in front of everybody that b-level work is bad for your soil and he says it's more important to invest in good people than good ideas because uh, a, a mediocre team can take a great idea and ruin it but a great team can take a mediocre idea and kick it through the field goals. And I have a minute 45 to get done. <clears throat> How to establish purpose. Name and rank your priorities. Be 10 times clearer than you think you should be. Uh, surveys of CEOs and, and executive leaders, they always, they always think like 60 or 70 or 80% of the people can name their corporation's mission. It's always like 12 or 15. You should be bored to tears. It should be like a knee-jerk reaction to be talking about your priorities. Figure out where the groups need to aim for proficiency versus creativity. Manage that culture accordingly. Again, embrace those catchphrases. They really make a difference. They're, they're, they may sound stupid or trite, but they really make a difference. Measure what really matters. A call center uh, did a, a thing where what really mattered to them was their customer engagement. And how do you measure customer engagement? I don't know. But what they discovered was what they measured call time, people would try to cut their call time, right? When they measured customer engagements, people would focus on customer engagements. So of course the bean counters, and you know, engineers too, people like with my mind are like, well, why measure it if you can't count it? Because what you measure focuses people's efforts. Even if you can't measure it exactly, if you could figure out some sort of rudimentary, semi-accurate scale on measuring positive customer engagements, you have and you start measuring those instead of other measurables that push people into a direction you don't want them to go you've done a great job and focus on bar setting behavior celebrate those people who are living it and doing it so that's it the culture code build safety and belonging share vulnerability establish purpose i did it and i'm proud of myself <laughs> so uh if this was valuable to you, there are lots of ways to think about this. Um, one, you could just pay me whatever you think it's worth. Is it worth a cup of coffee, a fast food meal, a dinner out? You can go to my website, highvaluetraining.com and use the button down there, or you can PayPal me directly, john.rallison at yahoo.com. If uh, you could also offer me return value by forwarding this lesson to others, if you made it all the way in, you must have found value in it. So please share it with other people. It can, it can really change leaders' lives and organizational lives. Uh, you can certainly, uh, if you're in the nonprofit sector, uh, think about what you would pay to use this, right? In the, in the nonprofit sector. Uh, and if you're like, just evaluating that this uh, me as a trainer so obviously i'm not expecting you to pay for it if you're going to use it in a meeting then that's great too because like i said i know i believe that live trainings are the best but this uh, can be very valuable so think about you know what would be a reasonable cost per person what would you pay you know ten dollars a person in a room full of 20 people whatever it's, it's kind of up to you i'm throwing it out there but uh i believe in a world uh of generosity and and a world where people freely share value with each other so this this is the model i'm trying anyways and i know some music groups do this too they just let people download their music for whatever they want to pay for it and i'm trying this out to see how it works so that's the culture code in 30 minutes or less by daniel coyle i'm john rollison live trainings are available uh, which I encourage you to do because there's, again, there's nothing like the engagement and application that come from a live training. You can visit me at my website, highvalutraining.com. And if you are still here, thank you so much for your kind attention. Have a great day. Bye-bye.